That was my first time recording too. Okay, sorry about that. I was in a good flow too. Okay, and we're back, you can see it. For those that are now in the recording aspect of this, I started the whole presentation without recording. So I'm gonna skip a lot of the beginning part. I'm just saying how youth named our building or our program Traverse, because we explained our philosophy of how, and I'll get into that, of how this is an outdoor uh, nature-based program. And I'll explain a bit of that later. And we bought them a bunch of pizza, all these youth, and they came up with the name Traverse. So I'm very happy to say youth named our programming, and that's kind of the philosophy going on forward for how we design the program. Okay, okay. so a little brief. So the operator we're Pacific Community Resources Society, uh, for those that aren't familiar, we're, while this is a substance use program, we also do employment, housing, youth and family supports, and many other aspects from Vancouver to the Okanagan. This program is for the Fraser region and is located in Chilliwack, BC. And part of the rationale for that was that because of the high rec component, we wanted aspects of the two rivers in Chilliwack and all the mountain ranges around here so that we can include that in our program. And the operational funding is sol solely through Fraser Health and the land and building was funded through BC Housing. So what happened to the, how do we get to the point with this kind of program? So over the last three years, we did uh, over 200 interviews, and that was youth and adults with lived experience. So youth that are in treatment, have been in treatment, are thinking about going into treatment, and families that were involved with that, and then our Indigenous neighbors. And then we also research other programs worldwide to see what works and what doesn't work. And we are, that goes includes a program that was getting very good results in Carolina. So we went out there and learned from them that they said all their program is 100% outside. And so we just wanted to learn that. So we hung out in the woods with them for a few days to say, wow, what works so well? And it was keeping the youth active and connected to nature that really, really seemed to help their treatment, meet their treatment goals. And so these 200 interviews and this research is the program and the research behind it all came into our model of care, which formed our Traverse program. So our programming model. Oh, all these photos were taken from one of our staff. She likes hiking. Uh, so I'm kind of preaching to the choir here, so I won't go too much into the specifics behind this, but that whole thing of how we connect to people, the opposite of addiction is connection. But we want to connect to not just humans and community, but also like we want to work through past trauma, work through relationship concerns that currently or past has happened but we also want to connect them to nature and have uh, activity based in the youth. When we're interviewing them that are in treatment, they said, stop getting us to be so bored. Let us have fun. I said, okay, that's, that's a good idea. So every single day we have outdoor therapy involved in our programming. We have a morning group where at each week there's a new theme, say it's identity or relationships. And we process that in the group. And then that group continues on into the afternoon where we do rec-based activities. Right now they're on a hike and then they're gonna do some pottery, I think. They don't know that yet, but that's what they're doing today. And then there's a home group at night where they uh, kind of practice their skills as well. So that, that's the nature and rec component. And then we also have, we wanna have a safe space to explore the relationship with their culture and spiritual beliefs. And that takes many different forms. While we do have an elder on site that helps with a lot of our programming, and she's marvelous and hilarious, uh, we also have specific cultural programming throughout the time. So I'm not only bringing elders to teach, uh, say, beating or storytelling and that sort of thing, but also to learn every other culture that is involved in this. And we want to do that not just through education, but experiential. And an example of that is Sunday evening is order in ethnic food nights. So we want to try learning about different ethnic foods as well when they're there because people can relate to food. I think selfishly, I just really like Thai food. And so, you know, I want to be involved in that. Um, and then another aspect of this is there, so we've got relationships with others that we, we want to work with them, relationship to nature, and then relationship to their spiritual culturality, and then the, the relationship with themselves. So uh, who are they? Are they still going, do they want to be identified as an addict or do they want to see who they are outside of the substance use? And we want them to experience that. So with that, there's training programs from cooking and skills training to volunteer activities, which I'll get to later. Just really get, empowering them to see like the beauty that they are. And with our uh, interviews that we did with the families, the families were really 
really insightful to talk to uh, for those that have had a loved one in treatments or experience or just have substance use in their life and never actually went to treatment. So with that, their big thing was, please, 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 please involve us. Please give us communication. I don't want to just drop off my kid and not know what's going on. And that makes complete sense, of course. And we also want to respect the youth as well if they don't feel it's safe uh, to identify with their family right away. So it's a balancing act, but we want to work with both sides. So some stuff we offer family involvement is we can we provide family counseling through our staff, which I'll show our staffing model later. Uh, we have a substance affected group. So that's a group uh, that for people that have a loved one caught in substance use concerns. And it's, you know, it starts out as, yeah, there's some psycho ed and then there's some debriefing, but it, it really is just normalizing and hearing that they're not alone. They end up taking over the group no matter how many PowerPoints we plan because they just, they just want to uh, tell their story and hear other people say that they're not alone in it and be together. So that's actively running right now. And then celebrations. This one was really cool out of another program we researched that just you take for granted that sometimes the family and the, their, their kids don't forgot how to have fun because they've been so focused on the problems and putting out small fires. So have celebrations on site and whatever that looks like from a magician to an elephant, we probably can't get an elephant, that's too big, but you know what I mean. Something where we can learn to have fun together and not talk about substance use that day. And then one that we're still uh, going to implement, we haven't quite yet, is coach letter writing. And I'm, assuming, I'm once again, you guys are all educated in this field, so you know the power of actually handwriting something versus taking a picture of the screen or whatever, or verbal. But coach letter writing is learning and language of asking questions and leaning in with curiosity as opposed to blaming or accusations or why haven't you stopped substance use yet, that sort of thing. So we work with the family, but also the participant to learn how to write that out. And so we sit beside them as they're writing. And then information sharing. So we, we do want to share uh, as much as we can without breaking confidentiality with parents about our program. If that's giving a tour on site or just learning a bit more about why we do the things we do, we want to provide that for them. And then I said we have a big volunteer aspect to this program. So that we, we have adopted parks and roads and we clean those up uh, regularly, as well as um, Chill Lake Lake Camp. We have a camp up there that we can utilize and we want to keep that clean too. Silver Surfers is when uh, our youth work with the elderly to teach them how to use their phones and how to Zoom their grandkids. And the youth really connect because that separation gap of, of age is so cool when they work together and both mutually appreciate it. So that's been a cool one to have. Of course, dog walking. And we have partnerships as well with like Polan Buddhist Association where they teach us to slow our minds down. And I find it's the staff that have the hardest time with that. So <laughs> it's pretty funny. But we want volunteering to be a regular aspect of this program. So it's in there. Okay, five phases. Keeping the nature uh, theme, we have five different phases of our program from seeding, it's supposed to be seeding, but it says plant, uh, to all the way to full maturation of a tree. So if within each phase, it is self-paced and we work alongside them, but there's workbooks that they go through through every single phase on their own. And it's just learning to expand their minds on certain topics of what they believe, what, what do they want to do in uh, with their future, and maybe some false uh, messages that they've got. How can we work through those? And so each phase is, while it's not a designated time, like plant is really, or seeding, it's just that first one to two weeks. And those that have worked with youth or participants in treatment know that first week is obviously the hardest. And if we can get through that, then we celebrate and we get into actually digging into the program through rooting. Um, actually, we had an artist do a custom mural here to on one of our walls. Oh, you can't see that. It's a PowerPoint. Yeah, I'll do that after the PowerPoint. Yuta just pointed that out to me. Once again, she is the smarter of the two. So they work through those five phases uh, to mat maturation where it's more leadership and giving back. So those, oh, there's the murals. So we have two lounges at the end of each hall. We have 10 rooms on either side of our building. It's a one floor building. And yeah, so it, it kind of depicts that nature theme of seeding all the way to maturation. I don't know why he put a giant wasp on each one, but he did. And so our whole building, uh, when we were designing it, because it was a brand new build, 
there's a lot of specific aspects of it that we wanted in. We wanted flooring that we would all want in our own homes, counters that we would all want in our own homes. To, like each, per, each individual room has their own bathroom and those handicap accessible bathrooms. And we wanted to feel like home. So another thing that we do is a welcome package. When they get here, we want to make sure that first week they just know that they're really appreciated, no pressure, but they, we want them involved when they're ready. But they receive uh, like a robe, uh, slippers, a Patagonia fleece, a toque from a local company, hiking socks, and then we take them to a Nalgene, we take them to a local garden store and they pick out their own plant that they have for their room and they learn that plant and name it. They come up with funny names by the way. And what's that? Jefferson. Jefferson. <laughs> um, one of them named the plant Steve and I still don't know <laughs> if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm waiting to gather the courage to ask her. And then um yeah so we get them their own plant and that's part of their room then there's a puppy barking right now and i don't know why we have a puppy right now because there's no participant here you're just gonna find that out okay um so another thing touch that we wanted to have was originally each dorm room or room had a number on it and it's just like oh that's institutional like you're, i'm in room 18 so we got an artist to do a custom mountain peak on every single room. So you're staying in Mount McFarland or uh, Peak Mountain or Frosty. And that's your room. And it's just that custom touch to try to take away the institutional feel. And then we have a local elder come in and teach about each peak, the history behind it and the, and the indigenous history. And then we hike them. Some we can't because they're like journeys, but we, we, then we want them to learn their mountain and really connect with nature that way so it's more of a personal touch so this question comes up we're kind of staffing and it's quite normal like director manager we have a clinical team lead that oversees our clinical counselors I think we have four or five clinical counselors we have a rec therapist that uh, does outdoor therapy on the daily uh, so that includes everything from hiking to whitewater rafting which is a good time of year right now for to rock climbing, zip lining, propelling, canyoneering, uh, you name it. So, and people always keep saying, well, why? That's one of our play therapy dogs. That's why, that's who was barking, okay. Um, so, uh, the rec therapist, oh yeah, so we, we have a thing and they say, well, it's, not everyone can rock climb. And I said, that's totally fine. Uh, we have a model here called challenge by choice. Uh, we stole that from one of our groups that we hired to lead some of our high risk activities where it's their choice how far they go into the rec activity. So if we go rock climb, I'll use an example, of, um, we did high ropes course. And so the high ropes, it, the only thing is everyone has to show up and everyone has to put on a, a climbing harness. Then we're all unified. And from that point on, it's your choice how far you go. So we have one youth that'll just rip up the 40 foot pole and do the leap of faith and no problem without even blinking. And I find that awesome. And then there's another individual, she just wanted to climb a ladder halfway and touch the pole. And so she did that and she was like overjoyed and she had the same amount of adrenaline as the one that jumped off the pole. So it's not that we demand they go into these scary activities, but we just ask that they be present and join to their level of comfort. So I just want to clarify that. So after that, we have uh, support workers, um, outreach connection worker. It's because that was a specific position we put in to try to limit that aspect of treatment where you drop off a youth at a treatment program and send them back to their home and hope that everything works out because that model is terrible. So with this, is we, as soon as we get a referral or a youth interested, we send out our outreach connection worker to meet with them, answer any questions they may have, um, maybe bring them on site, give them a tour to demystify it and start getting their care team. So the case manager has to refer them. The case manager or family or identified family, maybe some other supports and get that support network going before they arrive, involve them during, and then also when they uh, transition from our program that they're going to those supports as opposed to it just being a one-off. So we have uh, obviously a team of cooks because we are a licensed facility through Fraser Health so everything had to pass licensing inspection. Um, our cook, lead cook makes amazing pies, it's amazing. Um, our, our Brazilian cook made this coconut corn cake, it's unreal. I didn't think those things would go together but they do. 
as a side tangent. Okay, then we have an intake and transition worker processing all new intakes, uh, homemaker, and then of course uh, we have our medical staff. So we do have on call physician and addictions physician, uh, two psychiatrists, and then a, a nurse as well to help process uh, and keep and make sure they're first off if they are in meds on the right meds. Uh, what's their plan for that going forward? Are they physically safe? Are they in withdrawal? Those sorts of things. So we just want to make sure we provide that coverage for them. Oh, and Saffron. Oh, he'd be mad if I missed him. Saffron's our th one of our play therapy dogs. Uh, they all are uh, certified trained um, dogs for therapy. And we try to bring them in for youth that are uh, intaking, because that's a scary time, but also for some of the tougher groups um, topics. So we bring Saffron or one of the other play therapy dogs in. So how this works, it's a voluntary program. A youth uh, in the Fraser region wants to attend. Uh, then they uh, meet with a case manager, and that's through online news at Fraser Health uh, funded an MHSU clinician or contracted uh, through Fraser Health Clinician. Or we also, I think it's social workers through MCSD as well, can refer. And if you have any questions on that, Shannon Smith through Fraser Health, she's the intake specialist. So if we have a case manager, there are there there referral packages available online. You complete it with the youth. And you send it to the intake specialist. Uh, it's, that information's all on the form and online. She so makes sure all the information's there, and then it comes to us to see if it's a good fit for a program and the culture that we have right now. If it's a yay, we send out our outreach worker, and they connect, and then they bring them on site to traverse. So this is a couple pictures of the site. Um, we do have a basketball court. That gazebo is massive. I don't know why, but it's pretty cool. Uh, a couple of designs we had on the program is specific to youth input. They, when we were talking, I was interviewing a bunch of youth about programming. I was like, in one of our adventure-based programs we used to run. And I was like, hey, what's your favorite part about, like, today? They, that day they went to Whistler and went ziplining. And they said, the debrief on the way home. I was like, what? And I, I, to me personally, like, debriefs are boring but I guess they're very powerful. So the youth said, no, we like to talk and we don't like talking face to face. We like having everyone else face forward so that there's no pressure to us. Um, I was like, wow, okay. So we designed our facility. You'll, if some of you have ever come for a tour, our benches face greenery. They face trees, they face plants, not each other. And then we have a walking circle where we can process together amongst the gardens. And then we have garden beds and um, that they can learn how to do uh, from plants to plate, uh, learning that whole cycle to get charged that. So the whole facility is actually designed by the youth to say, this is how I prefer to do counseling. And another aspect that we have a canoe on the grounds because I think canoe counseling is funny. And so it's just sitting there on our yard right now and they can do a counseling session in a canoe. Okay, that's the brief presentation. I'm gonna stop, share and get back to all of you guys. Can you see me? Yes, okay, now I'm less of a moron and I can show you the <laughs> one of the murals is up there as well. So that's Traverse. Uh, we're really happy. We're fully running right now. We're doing intakes and active and yeah, we have Pacific Community Resources Society. We're really thankful to Fraser Health and BC Housing for this whole process. And to all of you who've been um, inquisitive and wanting to learn more about our program. So our goal is to information share. So feel free to ask any questions at this point. I'll try to check the chat as well. Um, but yeah, anything? I, I can start. I have a question. Um, I actually have a youth that's um, hoping to attend starting next week. And I, and I actually asked her, I said, hey, I'm going to this information thing, is there anything you think I should be asking? And uh, she said, yeah, find out all about smoking. I want to know all about what's a lot of smoking, what are the ins and outs? She said, any detail you can get. Um, so, and I thought that was something that I probably am asked uh, often by you. So yeah, if you could um, yeah. I, give me all that information. So. I'll do my best, Kat. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. And of course, that's a question and a daily, hey, Steve, add more smoke breaks, add more smoke breaks. <laughs> So here's the rationale behind what we decided. Um, research shows that uh, relapse rate are significantly decreased if you, do, if you have no smoking available on site. However, the youth said never do that. <laughs> so we did a balance of that where we took the average of a lot of other programs and reduced it. So we do have four designated smoke breaks every single day. 
they have to bring their own cigarettes and they can't share. So they have to come with them because we also can't buy them for their youth. Uh, we do provide smoking cessation options here should they want to, as well as alternative activities while there is smoking. Um, are you missing anything? The four smoke breaks. Uh, um, we do use patch as well during that yeah, time. Yeah, we can do patch or the um, vape. Vape with limited nicotine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and of course they want more, but we're kind of, we're trying to dig our heels in right now with four and get used to that. Um, and then we'll adjust from there. I think it's also working with the fire to intake around, um, you know, preparing them for that. So they may be smoking obviously quite a bit more than four breaks a day. So just talking to them a little bit about, you know, how are you going to transition into a program that has only four breaks and then really just keeping them busy during the day so they're not always wanting um, to go and have a cigarette and so far it's, it's actually been pretty good um, we're about three weeks in with our first youth and although the questions came we were able to provide alternative coping strategies in that moment with them in order to sort of distract them from just wanting to do the cigarette use so mm -hmm. yeah it's been all right so if you and I know you're Kathleen we're working with someone that you're referring like definitely the biggest information is the amount but also please bring yes. your own yeah. because that is very hard for us to navigate if you yeah. you're going through withdrawal on that yeah. good question thank you <laughs> yeah. I have a question for you if I could uh, mm -hmm. Great, thanks. I'm uh, Deb Cameron with the Surrey School District. So I do uh, drug and alcohol support there. We have a, a team of us that support students. So we would not be able to refer to you directly. Is that correct? We would have to go through Astra or through something similar? Yeah, yeah. that's how they designed the, the contract for this one. Okay. Um, I just had a question about, so the the outreach connection worker, um, I think that's a really cool idea and quite a unique idea. And um, I just was wondering if you could just give a little bit more information about like how that would actually play out. So like once you guys approve a referral and that youth has been notified, they've been accepted, that connection worker, do they call them first and then they, do they like pick them up and drive them to the Traverse on the same day they're accepted or like, yeah, like what's sort of the trajectory of that? It's a kind of a yes and, so that's a good question. It's the outreach worker, even if they, we haven't completed all the paperwork quite yet, their, their case manager contacts us saying, hey, there's someone really interested, we're starting the paperwork, but they're getting hesitance. We can send him out then and just demystify and try to answer any question the youth might have, like specific, probably about smoking. Can I have music? You know, those sorts of things that mean a lot to them. Then um, once it's accepted, he goes out and there's a lot of paperwork, obviously consent forms that we need the family to sign off on or individual. And so he, he does a lot of that aspect then as well. Because we also like for high risk activities, we have a lot of consents and video consents and those sorts of things too. So he does that then. And then if there's no transportation option, we can get him to bring them on site as well. Uh, and then we follow up with the intake. We obviously it's be easier if their case manager or family could bring them here because then we get to connect with them in person too. But if there's an ideal, then there's a reality sometimes. So that is an option. I got one. So um, I've sometimes had like, not recently because I haven't seen kids individually recently, but um, uh, kids who wanted to go with their boyfriend or girlfriend or, uh, or their friend. And I'm wondering about if you have any sort of specific guidelines around that in particular. Yeah, so they're both like, oh, sorry, you guys have a clarification question, Lisa, on like they want to visit or they both want to No, they both want to go. Like, let's say, yeah, or they, or they know somebody who's there and if they're, you know, mm -hmm. I've had that happen. <laughs> yeah. So I was like wondering about it and, and kids often kind of want to know, like, can I go with someone if we both want to so go? So we, we haven't put a set rule on that. Uh, it's, we've been trying, like, for example, we've been trying to avoid set rules on certain things and instead engage in conversation uh, with people about it to see what is the level of this. So that, I can break that down to, it doesn't have to be exactly seven days clean before arriving because A, that doesn't really happen. And B, um, like it's, it's no set time. And we just want to work with them and talk with them, say, what kind of state are you in? Is this going to be an influence or do we have to do our withdrawal management? And just negotiate that instead of that on a hard pass rule. 
Same with relationships. While they're not allowed to have relationships forming here on the site, we're going to work with them and talk to them about that. So that would be an intake processing on our end, Lisa, to say, what is a dynamic here? Are you able to withstand being like affectionate with each other during this time? And can you still focus on treatment while this person's here? And if we really want to get all those answers, and then we can make our decision from there. Same with, yeah, yeah, there's a whole bunch of scenarios. Like if they relapse on one of their uh, times, they're not kicked out, or, or times away from the program. We don't kick them out. There's no three strikes, you're out. I'm like, this is the time to process that because they're surrounded with it. So we want to teach them relapse prevention, but also safe relationships. So sorry, Lisa, I don't have an exact answer. Except I like that. That works for me with youth more often yeah. than not, right? And not having hard and fast rules that are... That yeah, are I just try to avoid those. Yeah, I just I treat more like humans that way instead of like an institution jail-like feel. Thanks. Yeah. Right, I have another question. Um, in comparison to like Peak House, um, I know that they have like, a, I believe like an on-site teacher as well. So when we explain Traverse um, and it being a nature-based, um, would youth also expect like they there's designated time for school or is it is it more just centered on on the program and the nature based? Oh, good question. Yeah, we do have a teacher as part of this program, and so once again, it's a yes and. So this is where we have we do have set times Tuesdays and Thursdays for a couple hour block where we do have um, specific uh, teaching on site through paper based but also through online. But then we wanted to get creative because the youth are doing all this skill-based training, cultural training, tons of physical uh, aspects that we can sign off or the teacher signs off on as part of their education plan for that physical ed, that's life skills, that's, that sort of thing. So it's a yes and, there's teaching on site, but also we're trying to see where we can get the most recognition for what they're already doing in programming to count as their schooling. Thank you. Yeah. You guys have great questions. I have another question. Okay. Um, uh, Four smoke breaks. Yeah. Yes. No. If for youth that are going to be turning nineteen, um, if they're turning nineteen, you know, relatively soon within a six months period, um, is that can they come? Do we have to prepare them for early discharge based on when they turn nineteen? Um, yeah, for sure. And Utah is just yeah. doing that right now. And we actually have youth on site who is um, turning nineteen during the time that she place with us. So um, historically, my experience has been that we need to get the age of exemption before they come into the program. But in my contact with our licensing officer, she said we're kind of moving away from that. And the idea would be get them into the program. They're 18 initially. So get them in, see how they like it, see if they actually want to stay, see if they actually even come in, first of all, before you get busy doing all the paperwork. And then connect with us um, once you have a, a more um, clear idea of how long they're going to be in the program for. If it definitely is going to go beyond their 19th birthday, then we can start the paperwork at that time and support you guys with and with that um, age exemption documentation. So it didn't sound to me like a big issue, and their direction was more like get the youth in and just make sure that they're actually wanting to be there and want to be there beyond that 19th date. And then we can work on the paperwork um, while they're already in there. Thanks, Kathleen. Any other questions? Uh, hey, Steve. Uh, Dave here from Impact. I got a question. Hey, Dave. Uh, so, say if a client comes in and they've been accepted, and they let's just say they change their they last two days and then they decide to leave. Is there a specific wait period of like? Say they change their mind again and they want to come back. Do they do they have to wait a week or two weeks or? Yeah, so I'm just creating clarification from you on that one. It's a really good question. Uh, we hold their bed for a, a little bit of a. I think we said five days, and um, I'm going to get back to see if that's what it actually is because you 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 know this day the scares of the first two days and then you get back home and you're like oh i missed the opportunity there and we don't want to go back to the back of the wait list but we also don't want to punish those on the wait list to wait longer so we try to find a balance we I think right now we're holding their bed for five days if they want to come immediately back okay sounds good i don't know what that magic number is but yeah i guess it also depends on the wait list Okay, 
there any other questions? Going once, going twice. And then uh, thank you. And like I mentioned, please feel free to reach out to us at any point. Um, I can even type my email into this thing here. If anyone has any more questions, if you're working with the youth that has questions, please, we, we want to information share. And I am still able to give tours of the site to uh, stakeholders. It just has to be on specific times, like, like a Wednesday afternoon where all the youth are doing like a long rec activity offsite, just so it's less people here and um, the youth are offsite. So if that's something you're interested in, please let me know. Thank you so much for taking time to learn about our program. And thank you, obviously, for all the great work you guys are doing, too. And looking forward to working together. Thank you very much. Thanks. Have a great afternoon.